It's frankly a surprise the Radeon 7 exists at all. When AMD first announced it was building a 7 nanometer graphics card back in June of 2018, they made it clear it was destined for the data center. Nvidia has had the high-end gaming market locked up since it released its RTX cards last summer, and it's left AMD in a strange spot. AMD doesn't currently have a solution to compete with Nvidia's proprietary RTX technology, and we thought it might just sit out the high-end competition until their new designs were ready. But then at CES, the Radeon 7 was announced. A $700 card designed for 4K gaming. Today, I'm really, really happy to show you for the very first time our new high-end GPU for gamers and creators, AMD Radeon 7. Radeon 7 is certainly speedy, and it's the first 7 nanometer gaming card on the market, but priced to compete with the RTX 2080 and lacking fancy NVIDIA-specific features like ray tracing, can AMD gain any traction? Here's some background. Three months ago, AMD debuted the Instinct MI60 and MI50, the first GPUs built on a 7 nanometer process. Broadly speaking, a smaller manufacturing process improves efficiency, letting a chip run faster or use less power. The new Instinct cards were based on a 7 nanometer revision of Vega 10, AMD's previous high-end gaming design, but were intended for data processing. The Radeon 7 seems to be nearly identical to the lower-end MI50 card, but tweaked for gaming, not number crunching. So what do we have here? This is essentially a revision of last year's Vega GPUs designed to run at higher clock speeds. Because of the 7 nanometer process, the GPU is smaller. This lets AMD cram in two more memory controllers, giving the Radeon 7 a whopping 16 gigabytes of memory. AMD is also using HBM2, or second-gen high-bandwidth memory. This is a lower-power type of graphics memory that runs at a slower clock speed than GDDR memory that's used in most cards, but can move a lot more data at one time. In the Radeon 7, it allows for a full one terabyte per second of memory bandwidth. Now, memory bandwidth is essentially how quickly the GPU accesses its memory to store the frames it's creating. It gets more important at a high resolution when each frame can take a ton of data. Either way, one terabyte per second is the fastest memory we've ever seen on a GPU, and it should be a huge asset to the memory-starved Vega architecture. Beyond that, the Radeon 7 features 60 compute units for a total of 3,840 stream processors. These are the fundamental units of AMD's graphic cards that do the basic math and draw your frames. The current Radeon architecture, called Graphics Core Next, is limited to 64 compute units and 4096 cores, which it actually first hit back in 2015 with the Fury X. The 60 cores of the Radeon 7 is also a step down from the 64 cores of its predecessor, the Vega 64. While it's unlikely, this does leave open the possibility of a 7 nanometer Vega with a full 64 compute units sometime in the future. Despite being a few processors shy of a full batch, the Radeon 7 takes advantage of the ones it has. The card is clocked at 1400 MHz with a boost speed of 1750 MHz. There may be other optimization that was done in the transition to 7 nanometers, but the boosted clock and speedy memory should let the Radeon 7 perform about 25% faster than the Vega 64. But does it? We had a limited stock of cards on hand, but we tested the Radeon 7 against its predecessor, the Vega 64, and an older NVIDIA GPU, the 980 Ti. In Wolfenstein, a game made with the AMD-friendly Vulkan API, the Radeon 7 really flew. With all the settings turned to ultra, it easily maintained well over 60 frames per second in 4K and crested 200 frames at 1080. The new Resident Evil 2 remake is extremely graphically demanding, but was actually a great showcase for the Radeon 7. As you adjust settings, the game shows you the estimated graphics memory required for any option. By cranking up texture resolution and shadow quality, we were able to use nearly all of these 16 gigabytes of memory, and we actually had to turn down some of the settings to get it to run on the 980 Ti. The Radeon 7 hiccuped a bit at 4K, but it still maintained playable frame rates as we repeatedly got eaten by zombies. Battlefield 5 has been a showcase for NVIDIA's RTX technology, so if your only reason for playing that game is to stare at photorealistic reflections, then AMD still doesn't have a good solution for you. But if, like me, you just like to play that game as some sort of extreme sports skiing simulator where you occasionally shoot Nazis, then it works fine. 
Frame rates hovered around 50 or 60 at 4K and were well over 100 at 1080 with all the settings turned to the max. Lastly, our compute results were a little confounding. In Cinebench's OpenGL and Geekbench 4's OpenCL tests, the Radeon 7 and the Vega 64 were nearly identical. This is supposed to be a measure of how good the cards are at processing data, and we'd expect to see the same differences between them that we did in the games. Future drivers and optimizations might improve the Radeon 7's scores, but for right now it's a little puzzling. One last synthetic test, 3D Mark's Time Spy, however, did show a difference between the cards, with the Radeon 7 scoring 9,194 to the Vega 64's 7,443, though we would expect the average 2080 to land at least 10% higher than either of these cards. On paper, the Radeon 7 may be a difficult sell for some gamers. While it does generally perform at least 15 to 25% faster than the Vega 64 in most games, it's not generally faster than the NVIDIA RTX 2080. All the current hype has also been around NVIDIA and their new proprietary graphics technology. RTX ray tracing allows for super realistic lighting in games, and DLSS can improve detail and smooth out jagged textures without the performance hit of traditional anti-aliasing. Without any answer to these technologies, AMD seems like it's in trouble. Except that six months after these new features were announced for NVIDIA, they're still barely anywhere to be seen. Battlefield V is currently the only game that supports RTX lighting, and Final Fantasy XV is the only one that supports DLSS. That feature is supposed to be coming to Battlefield in the future, and a host of upcoming games have promised to support either DLSS, like Anthem, or RTX, like Metro Exodus. But for now, they're not very useful features. Coupled with the frankly insane prices the RTX cards launched at, and maybe it's not a surprise that Nvidia confirmed its RTX cards aren't selling very well. Except AMD is not in a great spot either. Being so early to the 7 nanometer process means the Vega 7 is probably costly to manufacture, but AMD still did itself no favors by pricing it the same as the RTX 2080. Even if it does turn out to outperform that card in a few titles, we'd expect the differences to be pretty minor. I personally am not convinced NVIDIA's RTX gamble will pay off, but plenty of gamers willing to spend $700 on a graphics card may be willing to take the chance that it will. Aside from gamers, AMD has also angled the Radeon 7 towards content creators. That 16 gigabytes of speedy memory could be useful for handling high-res footage or complex 3D models. Having a decent GPU is definitely useful in content creation, but in our tests, all of the cards performed similarly, even when encoding 8K footage. Still, if you're a gamer who works in film or animation and needs a ton of memory for a specific program, and you don't want to spend thousands on a workstation card, the Radeon 7 could be a great choice. For the rest of us, it's proof AMD's manufacturing is on point, but we might want to wait and see what they make next. For more graphics card analysis, click to subscribe to Engadget. We're going to keep on testing new RTX games as they come out, and we'll keep you posted on everything coming from AMD. And for more graphs and performance details, check out our written review on Engadget.com. Oh,